Well, good morning. My name is Ted Gardner, and I'm uh, an interviewer for the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County. And uh, I'm interviewing Byron Williams today on the 12th of April, 2007, at the main library. And uh, our camera operator today is Dennis Daly, who heads our, our veterans interview program here in the history department of the library. And very grateful to him for the opportunity to to talk to you, Byron, and uh, uh, tell me, where were you born? Coshocton, Ohio. Coshocton, my God. You know where that is? Yes, I do. <laughs> east, east, northeast of Columbus. Yeah. <laughs> it's a nice between, town. Between uh, Columbus and Pittsburgh. Yeah, that's the Pennsylvania Railroad. Right, I should say so. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's a very interesting town. It's a very historic place, too, isn't it? Yeah. That's a Coshock Gump. Yeah. <laughs> Black Bear Town. How about that? <laughs> well, uh, well, when were you born? 1923. 1923. March 16, 1923. Okay. And uh, you went to elementary school there in uh, elementary school? Mm -hmm. uh, what? Well, when, when was it? Went all the way through. Elementary in Coshocton, went to high school in Coshocton High School, uh -huh. and uh, didn't have enough money to go on to college. So I went out to the West Coast and uh, got a job in a aircraft plant. You did Southern California, Southern Cal San Diego, San Diego, wow. and solar aircraft, and we were making exhaust systems for B uh, twenty four bombers. Yeah, consolidated. Uh, consolidated. Right. And uh, was out there for well, about, let's uh, see, I went out there in de January of uh, 41, 42, mm -hmm. and worked, worked there until uh, August of 42. Came back and enrolled in at Ohio State University and uh, worked. Uh, Went to school at Ohio State for till October, and then I enlisted in October of '42. That sounds but very then, familiar. Uh, I was still in school, mm -hmm. and you know, I got to tell you this story. Good. One of the guys that lived in the same rooming house with me says, "Well, let's go to the Navy." I said, "I don't know anything about the Navy. I'm from farm country." <laughs> And he says, oh, we got to do that. So he went ahead and enlisted. He, would, he and I were both freshmen at uh, Ohio State. And he and I, uh, he went ahead and enlisted in the Navy, and I enlisted in the Army. Mm -hmm. Well, the this, this main point of the story is he spent four years at Ohio State in naval training. When the war was over, he ended up taking a six weeks cruise on a destroyer and then was discharged. And you know, I said to myself, hey Williams, you were stupid to do that. <laughs> Why didn't I do that? <laughs> I should say, well, let's go back a little bit. <laughs> I know. Uh, um, your, your family uh, had a farm there in Coshocton? No, my dad uh, worked with the Ohio Power Company. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. But he was a, a hunter. Uh -huh. He loved to hunt coon dogs, rabbit dogs, any kind of dogs. And uh, so I got grew up with dogs and, and uh, hunting coon and hunting rabbits. The outdoor sports. And uh, so forth. Right. Did you have a family, uh, had siblings? And, uh, no, only child. Only child. So was I. Yeah. Well then, uh, what about, uh, tell me about high school. Did you have uh, hobbies or did you go with sports? Well, I was, uh, no, I didn't, uh, wouldn't, didn't participate in sports too much. I was playing football and basketball. Uh -huh. But then uh, I was class president, I was uh, high Y president, so I was uh, active in school, very active in school. Right, I know what you mean. I the problem was we didn't have enough my parents didn't have enough money, I didn't have any money. Right. My parents didn't have enough money for me to go on to college. Right. And my classmates that I associated with, 
did go to college. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here I was back in dear old Coshocton working in a grocery store. Then I worked in a pot and, plan, pot and, pot and pan factory where they were using steel to make uh, pots and pans. Mm -hmm. West Lafayette, Ohio. Heard of that one? West Lafayette, Ohio. West Lafayette. No? Okay. That's up there in that portion too? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in Coshocton County. Okay. And uh, I've heard of Bu Cyrus. <laughs> well, well this, is, this is way south. This is yeah, right. 10 miles from uh, Coshocton. Right. Anyway, uh, worked there until Pearl Harbor. And uh, what I was doing was working in the warehouse. I came back to work on Monday. The Pearl Harbor was on Sunday. Came yeah. back to work on Monday. And they, all the guys said, well, you're, my nickname is Barney, B-A-R-N-E-Y. Uh, they, they couldn't pronounce Byron. <laughs> <laughs> Tough name. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I had, uh, <laughs> Came back to work on Monday after Pearl Harbor, and all they said to me is, "You're on your way to service, and uh, you're going to have to save us." Okay. And the next day they fired me, <laughs> <laughs> and that was on uh, the 7th, the 8th. So uh, the following month is when I, you know, I didn't have any money, couldn't go to school. And so the following month is when I went out to the West Coast then, I see. in San how, Diego. How did you get out there? On train or what? No. Uh, one of my mother's uncles uh, was in the car business, and he was driving a truck, from Sudebaker truck, from South Bend to uh, Denver, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And he said, would you like to come along? And I said, yo, oh, I'd love to come along. So I, what I did was uh, rode with him to, to Denver. Then another uncle was up north of Denver. What's the name of the town? I can't think of it now. Boulder. Yeah, in there. And then uh, after we got there, then I had enough money to get a Greyhound bus to San Diego. Oh, my God. <laughs> what an experience for a youngster. My gosh, that was a great. So we uh, yeah. ended up with uh, the... Uh, my mother's sister was uh, chief of the women at Solar Aircraft. She got a good job out of this. And so she said, I'll get you a job at Solar Aircraft. Uh -huh. So went down to Solar Aircraft and started to work right away. What uh, type of thing did you do? Manual labor, <clears throat> straightening out the, the dings in the uh, air, exhaust system. Oh, aircraft. Exhaust system, and we did it all. And solar was right on San Diego Bay, mm -hmm. and uh, North Island. If you've been there, you've been oh, there. Yeah. Uh, in and out of there several times. Yeah. Did you fly in and out, or just? No, I didn't fly. I was on. A, I was on. A, well, I was on two different ships. But it's, uh, what, what kind I, of ship were you on? Well, my my first ship was a, a patrol craft, a very small boat. <clears throat> and then uh, uh, later in the war, uh, I was on a small aircraft uh -huh. carrier, uh -huh. an escort carrier built by the Kaiser Corporation. Well, my mother's other sister had married uh, a flyer, and he was uh, private licensed, prime, mm -hmm. and he had gotten into instrumentation, and so he was working at North Island on instruments for the Navy. And that was what his job. And I was live with them. I lived in a chicken coop on their property. <laughs> <laughs> and so the chicken coop on their property, and there was a guy across the street by the name of George Adams. And so he moved in with me to the chicken coop, and we buddied the whole time I was in California. I'll be here. So what we would do, we uh, warmed up, we'd go to work, on the second shift, and then the next morning we get up and go to the beach, and uh, go to the beach and live it up. Oh, and then go back to work. Wasn't that <coughs> wasn't that great? Great times <laughs> well, for a 
you know, when we got out there, well, they had uh, Browning 30 calibers on the roof in case the Japs came back live. Yeah. And uh, we, we saw a couple P-38s go into the drink, drink right there. Right. Coming in, they'd come in over the solar aircraft, land on North Island, and we had two of them, but these, they didn't make it. You know? well, yeah. yeah, that was, that was, that was, uh, that was not an easy plane to fly. No, I'll say it, it was a It was a testy little thing. It was a marvelous plane, but boy. Well, now, here you are working out there, <laughs> and uh, uh, of course, the war clouds uh, uh, all of a sudden were forming pretty heavily. They were already there. They were there. And San Diego, of course, was a great, uh, it was a great Navy town. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, it became a great all-military town with, with the Air Force and, uh, and the Army. Well, uh, the guy, uh, his name was Bob, uh, what the heck was he? I can't think what Bob's last name. He worked on instruments, and he was with the Navy. So he knew everything that was going on. Sure. And, uh, of course, then the first thing that happened was the uh, Lexington was sunk. Yeah. And, uh, he, of course, he'd come in and tell us all about the Lexington yeah. was, sink, was sunk in the... Out of the Midway. Mid well, no, not Midway. When, uh, Lexington was before the Midway. Oh, yeah. Coral Sea. Coral Sea. Coral sea. And uh, then uh, the next thing was the Battle of Midway. And they, we lost one and they lost four. Yeah. And uh, so he would come in and tell me all that. And that might be one of the reasons why I decided I didn't want to go to the Navy. <laughs> I was thinking about, hey, what's going to happen to me? <laughs> I know, out there on the deep blue sea. <laughs> oh, God. I was a good swimmer, but not that good. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, then, uh, how, how long were you there at Solar? Laird until. September, September for 42. 42, right, and then came back and uh, had enough money to start at a high state, and I started at a high state in October then at 42, mm -hmm. and uh, I also enlisted in the navy or in the army October to 42 at, at a high state. Well, I uh, put down that I'd like to be a, an aircraft technician or I'd well, like to be an aircraft pilot. Anyway, went through and started the College of Engineering at Ohio State and went all the way through until March of 43. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the magic thing happens, the Army Specialist Training Program. Oh, yeah. And so I was uh, accepted then to the Army Specialist Training Program and went from there to Ohio State to Michigan State in the ASTP. Yes. Your son's in the AST, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a marvelous program. Yeah, it was a good program. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And then the government, well, at Michigan State, it was the, I got a lot of good education up there, a lot of engineering education. Mm -hmm. So it was worthwhile. Yeah, well, of course, Ohio State and Michigan State both land grant colleges, you yeah. know, a good solid, no. <laughs> solid basis of education. Well, uh, so there you were in the ASTP, and uh, what uh, what came out of that? Well, you know, Uncle Sam got around short of people. Right. And they canceled, I was there from, uh, I got up there and June, July, and they ran short of people, and so they took broken, broke then the following December, they broke up the ASC team, mm -hmm. and they shipped all these guys out to various infantry outfits. Oh, infantry, boy, boy. And they all went to infantry. And I went to an outfit called the 66th Division, and uh, at Camp Robinson, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And I got down there when it was, uh, they were on maneuvers, God, cold, froze to death, Camp Robinson, Arkansas. And I stayed with that outfit learning how to 
You know what a Bailey Bridge is? Where you been? All right, Bailey Bridges, uh, wood, wooden bridges, all that stuff, yep. corduroy roads, right? All, everything on the uh, right. combat engineers would do. Sure, of course, breakdown and, and, and portable yeah. and all yeah, that sort of thing. So we uh, spent the, uh, well, I guess we spent four months there, and then I saw a, 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 a notice on the bulletin board that. Uh, if you'd like to apply for OCS, do so. Well, I said, okay. I can't get any worse, but that wasn't a good move to <laughs> go to OCS because the first pe person killed in the OCS was the uh, infantry officers. Oh my gosh. And they were, uh, they had the biggest casualty rate of anybody. Right. Anyway, I applied to OCS and uh, we in the meantime had left Fort Robinson, Arkansas to Camp Rucker, Alabama, which is uh, a little bit north of, uh, well, the panhandle of Florida mm -hmm. in Alabama. Anyway, uh, went down there, uh, was accepted then, and smart enough to get into OCS, joined OCS in uh, September, August or September of uh, 40, Three. So here I am back in OCS and I went through OCS. They did get you in awfully good shape. I was tough and strong and I could really right. get around. <laughs> you know, we'd, we'd uh, <clears throat> go through the daily routine and then that night we'd uh, get together and a group of us would run. We'd run for another two hours. Mm -hmm. And then cross country and that's yeah, right. just any place all over. Sure. And then we'd start again the next day. But this was a betting school for boys, and you learned everything you needed to know about guns, ammunition, and uh, mm -hmm. attack, and so forth. Anyway, then that picture is of my graduation from OCS. Oh, yeah. That you got here. And uh, went back to see my wife. She was my classmate in high school, and uh, we were married. And I asked her to wait for me, and she says, "No, I can't do that." How <laughs> about that? And uh, so uh, I went to OCS, finished up, graduated then in November of uh, '43. Mm -hmm. And after graduation. I got my orders, and I was going to the European Theater. Now, there was some 200 and some people in my company. And of those 200 people, 199 went overseas to Europe. There was one guy who stayed in the States, and we, I still wonder to this day, how the hell did he pull that one off? Oh, gee, <laughs> Isn't that funny? How about that? Now this is the 66th division. No, this is OCS. There's no division. No division. No division. But I you're mean, you're assigned. Were... You're assigned division. You're see? assigned. Yeah. After you get to the European theater. Oh, I see. After you got overseas. Yeah, whenever okay. you, wherever, wherever they watched the latest uh, Second Louis. Sure. That's when the Rebel Depot came into fact. Sure. But anyway, that's ahead of me. Anyway, <laughs> I, I went from. Uh, Got my delay en route to see my future wife, and got my delay en route. We went into Fort Meade, Maryland. I did, and a whole bunch of the graduates went to Fort Meade. And at Fort Meade, uh, you know that's close to Washington, so we had one heck of a time. We were about two weeks there. We did nothing but party. <laughs> at Fort Meade, Maryland, we partied in Washington. Oh God, we, we, we knew Washington upside down. Oh, and that was exciting times in Washington too, <laughs> with everything that was going on. So, uh, okay, so then I got the word that, okay, I was going to ship out from Boston, Massachusetts on the SS Aquitania, 25,000 troops and me. So transported up to, up to Boston joined the uh, Rebel Devil system in Boston, and they said that all right, all of these new Second Louis 
had to take over and shepherd a group of uh, no, there were 36 guys that had to shepherd them on the boat and get them to the Rebel Devil in Europe. My name was Williams, and so what they did was start out with A in order alphabetical <laughs> order, <laughs> A, and down to W. <laughs> and W, they said, Williams, okay, here's 36 guys, that's 36 members of a platoon, and you're going to take them over. However, these 36 have all gone AWOL and jumped ship on previous shipments. Oh. And I got, you know. Sound like the dirty dozen. Yeah, and, and I was. Yeah. 36 of them. Oh, but. <laughs> so uh, I, you know, I got them all outfitted. You had to outfit them with clothes and every, all the gear they needed and everything. And I got them all fixed up. And, you know, they were getting antsy now. They were, oh, yeah. they, they've been through this before. <clears throat> you know what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, I said, okay. Well, the captain that was head of this group that was I was a part of, he said, now you got to watch these guys. He says, uh, they're pretty slick. They'll, they'll get away from them. So we shipped out of all times Christmas Eve. Here we are. Christmas Eve, we're shipping out on the Aquitania out of Boston Harbor. But to get there, we had to march from the, the stockade area <laughs> down to the ship. Well, I said to him, I said, okay, let me tell you guys something. I better arrange so that you're going to march down to the ship under guard with live ammunition. No two ways about it. We're going to have live ammunition on all these MPs. Now you understand this? Oh yeah, yeah, they understood it. So Christmas Eve, we marched from <coughs> the area where we were had stayed down to the ship and onto the ship. Do you know I lost one? I lost one. So I was down to 35. <laughs> <laughs> Here I am, started out with 36, and now I got 35. How that guy got away, I'll never know. You never, know. never, never in the world will know. Well, anyway, the Aquitania went south to Bermuda, then we turned back up to Glasgow in Scotland right. and uh, unloaded there in Glasgow. And there was a big train there for us. Were there, on the Aquitania, that was, uh, that was a canard liner. Uh, how many troops were aboard, do you know? I said 25,000. 25,000, yes. A whole city moving. Yeah, 25,000. Amazing, okay. We, <laughs> anyway, we, we made it safely. No U-boats or anything like that. And no U-boat scares either. Mm -hmm. we didn't have to get so we got into Glasgow, Scotland. And they had trains set up for us to move us south. We were going to go from there down to Birmingham. And uh, so I got my 35 guys <laughs> on the train. And, uh, you know, they didn't stop very often, but very occasionally they'd stop for some reason. Uh, maybe a, an air raid or something like that. Right. I got to Birmingham and they marched us uh, under armed guard again into a barbed wire enclosure. We were under barbed wire. I lost five men in from Glasgow yeah. to Birmingham. For five men. How they got away, again, I don't have any idea, but I was down to, <laughs> I was down to 30. Sorry <laughs> for 36, I'm down to 30. This heavy attrition. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we, we, uh, <laughs> We, uh, it was, you know, I, I had no one to report to or anything like that. I just told them what the number was. Right. But, the, the, you know, the paper pushers had the names and all that stuff, and they were doing all they could do. But we were under barbed wire there until New Year's Eve. 
and we were to load up and go to a harve on New Year's Eve. And it's, it's a small world. The outfit that I left, the 66th Division, was also going across the channel on New Year's Eve. Unfortunately for them, they lost a whole battalion. They had one ship sunk. And they lost a whole, whole battalion of uh, their outfit. 800 people. And, uh, you know, I think about that and I say, well, a good thing I didn't <laughs> stay with them because I could have been in one of those. There was another lucky one yeah. for you, yeah. yes, I should say. Well, there you were in the, uh, so you got across the Lahav and... Uh, didn't you, lose anybody on the trip across. Okay. <laughs> Nobody jumped ship. Nobody jumped ship. <laughs> <But, laughs> so what did you join up with there? Uh, we had a rebel depot system and we were to go from Le Havre to Jive, Belgium, G-I-V-E-T. Mm -hmm. And the rebel depot was in Jive. And I started out with 30, and I'm, we were 40 and 8, you know, the old 40 and 8s. So if you've been on them, or you, you've experienced them. 40 men or 8 horses, yep. whichever is <laughs> most whichever convenient. They needed. <laughs> or had. Whichever <laughs> most convenient. <laughs> we, that winter was the coldest winter they'd had in, in Europe in a long time. And you know, barbed wire fence, or just fencing, where the frost was that big around it. Oh, it was terrible. And we, we started out from Mahar, and we got into oh, several days, I guess it was, from there to going on to Jive, and we stopped. And uh, guys would jump off and run and get the wine from the from the French people who trade roadside, and uh, you can imagine what happened. I <laughs> I lost yeah. another. I had eight. I was down to six. <laughs> I had lost another eight people going across from Lahar to Jive. These are all people who are out there going to fight for their country. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we got into to uh, Juve, and I brought my report into this captain, and he says, Lieutenant, what in the hell did you do with those other guys? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Captain, I don't know where they are. They're probably there. Like I said, and I said, we've got one in Boston, five in England, and eight someplace in France. Oh, he said, no, he said, well, we'll have to take them. But what happened then was, uh, you stayed there for several days until somebody lost a lieutenant, and then uh, you were you up were. for grabs. <laughs> so uh, that was, by then it was about, uh, oh, the, probably March, or probably January the 8th or 10th, something like that. So, uh, stayed there in Ruppel Duppel, took a side trip down to Aachen, wanted to see what the Germans had defended down there, and uh, was then assigned to Company H of the 102nd Division. And that's my outfit that I went in back to, you know. Uh, what was that division called? Did it have a name? Uh, Ozark. Ozark. Okay. A, I got some more literature. Right. <laughs> Ozark division. So they came out of Arkansas and so forth. Yeah. yeah, the Ozark. Did the basic training and I, I was, wasn't with them, but no. they did the basic training. And the other thing was that uh, my experience in World War II was that I didn't make friends with people that I was fighting with sure. because too often they were gone like that. Right. Yes. So here I am in Jive, Belgium, and finally about uh, January the 12th, I guess it was, no, yeah, January, no, probably January 12th, 13th or 14th, I don't know when I got my first purple part. But anyway, I was assigned then to the 102nd Division 407th Regiment, Company H, 2nd Battalion. 
went up there and joined the outfit on, uh, let me get the date, sir. Sorry if I look at the dates. Sure. Well, <laughs> I got to meet the captain and the and major. Major was the uh, company, well, a captain of the company H. And then the uh, G2 was uh, back at regimental headquarters, stopped through regimental headquarters, and then went on up to, uh, from regimental went on to uh, company headquarters. And the regimental headquarters said, well, uh, at this point, right was when the, the bulge was in full blossom. Mm -hmm. And this regiment, the 407th, was Corps Reserve. Now, usually you have a full infantry division for a Corps Reserve. But uh, everybody was so, so short of manpower and so forth. So, here we had a company that was going to be reg division reserve, and uh, they were back in reserve. And the, I joined the company then, Company H, and Company H is a heavy weapons company, and what it does is you shoot your mortars, and you shoot uh, heavy machine guns and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, uh, got there on the 16th, and the guy says, you know what, Lieutenant, I think what we need to do is break you in. So we're going to send you up to the 406th, Company H of the 406th tomorrow, and they're online, and you can go up and be indoctrinated. So we'll send you up tomorrow. So I said, okay, fine, now I'm ready. So the next morning, I, I, went back to company headquarters and they had a jeep driver for me and uh, we took off, well, it was about seven in the morning, and we took off to go up to a town called Linder, L-I-N-D-E-R-N, Linder, Germany. And this was right across the, the uh, line from uh, Holland, mm -hmm. right in that whole area there. So we took off <laughs> going up there and he says, oh God, it's cold. He says, now Lieutenant, what we got to do is we got to make certain we don't have any uh, glass showing. So he said, the Germans are, have a height on us on, across the river and they can see us and they've got these intersections, or road intersections, pretty well and zeroed in. And he says, so we'll take Put the windshield down, and we'll take off. Mm -hmm. So, God, imagine that. Probably the temperature was probably about uh, eight or ten degrees Fahrenheit, something like this. And we take off, and every time we come to an intersection, he slow down. And he says, "Now, we got to be careful here because you got this one pretty well zeroed in, and you'd look out and they round either side of the road." And there'd be the fresh black marks of artillery. Mm -hmm. So he knew what he was talking about, and I said, "Oh boy, God, thank God he did." So <laughs> he got us up there. We went all the way to Lindern, and I met met the company. I went into the company commander in Lindern, in a little old farmhouse, and met this lieutenant, I don't know what the lieutenant's name was, but he says, okay, you're going to come with me today. He says, what we did, he said, we captured a whole slew of 80 millimeter mortar ammunition, German. And see, their Germans would, 80 millimeter would fit into our 81 millimeter tubes. Oh. So he says, we're going to give the cops some of their ammunition back today. <laughs> So he said, come with me, and here I am in Linder, first day online. I hadn't been online before. And all of the German houses there had three-foot ceilings, cement ceilings in their, in their uh, houses. The house was three-foot ceilings into the basement. 
And it was uh, bomb proof, really. Uh -huh. uh, really bomb proof. So, uh, went to see the company commander there. He showed me, met me with the lieutenant. And he says, okay, what we're going to do is going to go on up here. And uh, we got an OP on the edge of the town, an observation point. And he says, we're going to shoot to 80 millimeters back at the crowds. So we get up there and you be careful, don't show yourself, to, they'll, they'll be watching you and so forth and so on. So, got up there and we spent the whole day shooting 80 millimeter mortar shells at the Germans across the river. But the, the river was the uh, Roar, R-O-E-R, Roar River, and they were on the other side. So, he said, be careful, don't get, don't show yourself out of these windows. And so you be careful not to see or look out at that. You watch where the, uh, where the shells will land and, and you correct and so forth and so on. And in front of this house, last house on the, uh, in the town, was where our OP was. You look out and you can see the GIs, hells out there where they spend the night out there and then then uh, come back in in the morning and it was cold oh my god those poor devils they were out there all the time so uh we shot oh, I, mean, I don't know how many we were at least shooting four an hour and we'd shoot correct shoot correct or whatever our target was and we did that the live long day and this guy would do his stuff, the lieutenant. He gave me a lot of tips on how, how to handle 80 millimeter or 81 millimeter mortars. Mm -hmm. About four o'clock, he says, well, I'll tell you what, he says, I think what we ought to do is go back. He said, now the Germans will, they know what time we're gonna eat. And he said, they'll time their, their counter barrage at five o'clock tonight because that's the time the chow truck, or the chow jeep comes up from the, account, the company kitchen. So at four o'clock, we start back down through a little orchard to get back to company headquarters. And we hadn't gotten, well, of course, we went down the steps all the way and started back, and we hadn't gotten over, oh, a couple hundred, no, a hundred yards at the most, and damn, two mortar shells behind us. And he says, come on, let's roll. And we started running as fast as we could run down toward back to the company. Well, I didn't know how to get there, so I had to follow him. Sure. And we ran all the way back to the company headquarters. We got there and got inside, and it was in an old farmhouse, and the German farmhouses uh, and I told you about the three-foot ceiling, so we all dived to the basement, and we were in the basement. And finally, the, uh, act, the uh, mortar shells stopped. We were all clear, and it was the mortar shells were crouched all the way. They were coming right down. Well, those German houses, those farmhouses, had a the center was the dung area, and they had a, a house here, and the cattle were over on this side, and in the middle of the courtyard was where they did their, left all their, their dung and everything like that. We were sitting there, and we came and decided, well, it's all clear now, there's no more shells coming in. He said, let's go on upstairs and we'll talk up there. Went upstairs and uh, he says, why don't you do this? He says, why don't you peel yourself some potatoes? Why? He says, I'll be something for you to eat. Okay. And he says, uh, do that. And this is very heroic now. I take my steel helmet off and I found some potatoes around there and I had steel helmet between my knees and I had the old helmet liner on and started peeling potatoes. And just then, two mortar rounds dropped into the courtyard. Wow. <laughs> the courtyard, 
And I remember one guy saying, I can hear you knocking, but you can't come in. <laughs> and then the next two hit right on the peak yeah. of the house where we were right underneath it. And that's how I got my first purple horn. Got hit in the head. Oh, you right here. Didn't have your helmet on. Come on, what's between yeah. the knees? Hell, the elevator didn't do much good. Hell, it didn't do a damn bit of good. So, <laughs> oh God, they, they, they took me back to the aid station, patched me up, and, uh, you know, I think one of the things that, I think the reason I'm here today is because I was hit the first day out of there. Because I think that made me more aware of how it can happen and how you have to be alert to what you're doing. Right. Exactly. That was a, it was a, really I think it was a saving grace for me. It was a big lesson, wasn't it? Yeah. I should say. First day online. How about that? Well, now this, you're talking January uh, 45. January 17th. Yeah, so you're, you're, um, uh, were you on the fringe of the bulge? Way north of the bulge. Way north of the bulge. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> well, your your experience there in that oh my gosh, that German farm village that that's that, that's really something. How uh, were there a lot of uh, were there a lot of uh, wounded uh, men under your uh, leadership? Not then, not then, not then, but then later, later on. Yeah, because you uh, you kept moving on east, right? Yeah, this was just. Purple Heart number one. Okay. The uh, overall plan was uh, that Simpson was going to jump off with his whole 9th Army across the Roar River, R O E R, and uh, then they were going to go up to the uh, Rhine on the way to the Rhine. So the next thing that happened was okay, I got recovered from that. And I didn't have to go to the hospital on that one, but I recovered from that one was that uh, we had to get ready for jumping across the rock to the roar. And so the Krauts opened the dams. Yes. The Roar River dams, you've probably heard of them. Yes. And then the whole area was flooded again. Right. So where we were supposed to get off around the 20th or 21st of January, uh, they couldn't because the water was too hot. So we all then started, we went back several times to practice uh, crossing in pontoon boats. Sure. And with the engineers, and the engineers would uh, take us across the river back in, in Holland, right then, Gottenkirchen, and then we'd uh, go through that Thing all the way. Right. Did you, use Bailey, you didn't use Bailey Bridge there. Oh no. Crossing the road. No. No, it was all, <coughs> it was all <coughs> by small boat. boat. Assault boats. Small Assault boat. boats with yeah. two engineers, one in front and one in back, and paddled like hell. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so uh, we practiced that. And we do that with, uh, you know, you'd be driving back and then you'd all of a sudden do in a convoy. You stopped the convoy and there somebody had spotted a plane and boy we bail out one of the crowds who were coming after us with straight in the area and so forth. Goodness so uh, that the thing the where it had originally planned to be around the twentieth or twenty first of January for the assault across the war. And now had to delay it. And so all the time we delayed it, we, we zeroed in every, all the artillery we could on the uh, other side of the roar. And then uh, when we did that, we also had to uh, uh, make certain we knew where we were going. So that was a period of waiting. I had meantime of back healthy and high, no problem. Right. <laughs> I was back again. And so uh, during this time, we uh, 
there in, in the edge of Germany, in the town of Linnich, L-I-N-N-I-C-H. And uh, Linnich was the uh, jumping out point for my uh, battalion, and we were going to go across with uh, assault boats. Uh, nothing happened really. You, you know, you come up every day and you look at where you're going to land and what you're going to see and so forth and so on. Well, on the 23rd of February was the assault date. And the night of February 23rd, around midnight, the preliminary barrage took, uh, took effect. And the barrage was probably one of the most ear-splitting things I'd ever been around. Perfect. They had every, they had every 155, 105s, every, every possible gun. They had all picked out, selected, pre-selected targets over there. And they just let it go. And so it went on from 12 o'clock until 4. Wow. And it was just ear splitting. Ooh. We, in the meantime, had started marching up from Gallenkirchen, which is a little town in the back, uh, marching up. And we went into Lineage and into a, a basement of uh, one of the towns down the riverbank. And the riverbank was, had a dike on the town side. Mm -hmm. And what happened was that they would uh, take the boats and they got the boats over the dike, down next to the creek itself, or the river itself. And so what we were to do was hold up there in the basement and hold up until such time as uh, they gave us a word and then we would go. So that was about two in the morning and we got into the, the uh, basements. About four in the morning, the engineer, one of the engineer uh, who was on our boat, says, okay, you guys, let's go. And we came out of the basement, and there was a, it was a machine gun nest across the river. And that crowd was sweeping that dike area. And so he would first, first fire to the south with MG-42, you know. That's the fast one to go brr, brr. Mm. And he then fire the north, fire the south. So we got out of the basement of the, of the uh, at Lineage. And the guy says, now what we got to do is get across this dike and down to the boats uh, while he's for, uh, firing to the north. And then we'll make it and then he'll turn and fire the south and we'll be okay. Well, we were lucky. We didn't lose anybody uh, getting into the boats. Hmm. We uh, got them into the boats. The boats, uh, the guy got us across the river fine. <laughs> <laughs> he got us across the river and we started in, we had the town, the town of Gevinich. I got maps of that, just near about what you want that or not. Gevinich, and we started crossing uh, to the Gevinich. And the flood, flood plain on that side was very flat. Mm -hmm. And what happened was that those people, I'm talking too much. Huh? Well, we're, we've got some time. Am I talking too much? No. Right. Uh, anyway, the flood plain had been mined. Oh. And I had the platoon I was with, I had my platoon, I had a guys that had been in service and who had also been in action before. Mm -hmm. So we started across that floodplain and we were running into trip wires. Ding, ding, and God, you know, that's a sign of the mine had been up in the air, but thank God that they had been underwater for something, two weeks, oh. and they didn't go off. Oh, that saved you. Oh, well that, that was, that was really trying. Now, where did you get your second Pearl Heart? Uh, Pearl oh, Heart. Right You're now. coming to that. <laughs> okay. So we get on the other the side was a, a railroad bank over there, and we were headed for the railroad bank before we decided where we were going to go next. 
and uh, town of Gevinich. And so we got to the bank, and the bank had been, uh, I guess the council wanted to, to uh, make certain that nobody was going to get in there. So they plastered it with phosphorus. And uh, we got up to the railroad bank, and you know, you're down on your hands part of the time, up running, down on your hands. And I was unlucky enough to get myself plastered with phosphorus. And my, uh, from here to here, on this right hand, was just glowing. The you know, phosphorus just glows. And uh, some of the guys who were with me uh, said, oh, Lieutenant, you better go back to the aid section. I said, oh, I don't think so. I said, I'll put some mud on it and that'll be all right. Well, it didn't do anything. It just showed through the mud. Anyway. Really? Oh, okay. And uh, so then finally, uh, I ran into the captain. And he, I said, oh, I can go on. Let's go ahead. He said, no. He said, you go back and get this taken care of. You better do that right now. So here I am, well, at least 300 yards from the river, and I've got a phosphorus all over me. And so I start back in to find the uh, yeah. aid station. Got back there, and about that same time, uh, the Germans had realized that the, this was the jumping off spot, and so they opened up with all the artillery they had. They had 155s, 105s, all the artillery coming in. And here I am going back to the river, and there we've got the river pretty well zero dead. But I made it. But anyway, I got back to the river bank, and uh, the boats were on this side, of course, and uh, the river where I was. And I heard this voice calling, somebody help me, somebody help me, I can't walk. And I finally found a person, and somebody had been shot through the leg here, it had hit a bone but he couldn't walk. I said, well, let's see if we can get you back across the, the uh, roar. And so he and I found a boat. I found a boat, brought it back to where it was, and got him in it, and then I paddled him back across the river. Mm -hmm. And we must have gone three or 500 yards downstream, uh, which is to the north, before we finally got to the other bank and uh, I said, okay, I'll stop you here, pull it up on the bank, and then I'll, I'll get somebody from the A station. I had to look for a find an A station because that wasn't where we had taken off from. We'd taken off much further uh, to the south of that. So uh, got back to the A station, and boy, they took one look at my arm, and they said, okay, you're staying here. They put me in the hospital for five days. So, uh, did it burn? Yeah. You had a burning sensation? So, that was Purple Heart number two <laughs> for five days. <laughs> for heaven's sake. I never did find out what happened to that guy that I got back across the river. Uh, I hope that somebody found him. But I hope so too. Yeah. Well, I should say, well, you're, you're just, uh, gosh, here. <laughs> Here you are under fire, really, <laughs> under heavy fire. And those, uh, that barrage from the enemy must have been horrifying. Oh, well, they were, well, there's pictures, we get pictures of uh, people still in the Yeah, because they, uh, the Germans had some tremendous firepower. Sure did. My goodness sake. Anyway. Did, did you see the, did you see the German planes? Uh, not that time, but uh, when I, after I'd been in the hospital for five days, <coughs> they said, okay, we got, I don't know what they put on there, they got it under control. Said, okay, you can go back up the line. <laughs> Swell. So I started back and, and uh, they drove us back home maybe uh, 10 miles or so, and then we had to walk the last couple of miles. And while we were going back to where we were in Lineage, uh, by this time, they had bridges across, okay. and the bridges were, uh, well, were pontoon bridges really, mm -hmm. for all of the uh, 
trucks and everything, and there were ammunition and everything going up. And while going up, all of a sudden all the uh, anti-aircraft opened up and there were some P-47s flying around in cover and this jet came in. First jet I'd ever seen. Yeah. And he was, uh, you saw the bomb come down and all he missed, but uh, that's the first jet that I'd ever seen. Right. They're going back up. Yeah. Well, we got back across the river and I finally got up to uh, join me a company now. And uh, they were on our way to three major cities here, um, Krefeld, Munch and Gladbach. And we started going for that. And uh, I was still with this platoon. Five minute break? Five minutes. No, five minutes to go. Five minutes to go? All right. And that's two purple hearts. <laughs> okay, we got. How many guys did I get there with? <laughs> <laughs> they were. Oh, goodness sakes. Oh, well, I got one more. Uh, two more. I got to tell you two more. One more was we all made it to the Rhine River in Rheinhausen, across from Dusseldorf. And the Rhine is about like the, the Ohio, a little bit wider than the Ohio. And they wanted to make some, want to go across and make a uh, raid to capture a prisoner. I was unlucky enough to get uh, assigned this, this thing. The thing was that they had came up with the idea of using a electric motorboat to get us across the Rhine River. There were six of us this little Rhine boat, motorboat, and it was battery operated uh, motorboat. And we were to go across and go up on the floodplain, and they thought there was, they knew someplace up there was where they had uh, a outpost, get to the outpost, capture somebody and bring them back over. But to make certain that they, we were protected, they decided that they would give us a box barrage for protection. And this would be where, this was our landing point in the river. Either side of that, they would send a chartillery barrage, either side, and then across the end. So everything was box barrage, all set up. We got across the river, fine, and uh, started crawling to get us up to where we thought the OP was. In the meantime, the box barrage was so effective that they had two houses catch fire. Wow. And those houses were just blazing like crazy. And what it did was just made everything down here sand out. You couldn't. Sure. Illuminated. Illuminated. Wow. Cool. We couldn't even, you, even where we were crawling. Yeah. So, we finally said, well, that's enough of this. We can't do anything with, with that uh, illumination going on for right. Right. So we turned around and came back again. Well, and got back across with no, no cash. Well, you sure were lucky on that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, Byron, this, this has just been a revelation to... Well, I got one more story I've got to tell you about. Okay. This is, this is one more. All right. And then I'm going to leave. Uh, <laughs> This is the closest I came to being killed at any time I was there. Uh, we were on the Elk River, my platoon, and we had four or five houses all together on the Elk, up and down the Elk River bank, and uh, we'd gotten a new replacement someplace, I don't know where it came from, and the guys were in, uh, my sergeants and I were in one house, and the rest of the men were in the other houses up and down the Elk River. This one morning I was uh, doing some paperwork. I looked, I heard this noise, looked out, and there was leaves coming down off the trees. This was right at the end of the war. And like this, and I thought, well, that's the Thompson Sun Virginia. 
So I said, what the heck's going on? So I went out the back door, went over to the house next, looked at it, and that's where the noise was coming from. So I turned and walked up the steps into the kitchen area. Uh, I did that, and this GI, one of the new replacements, evidently had gotten a hold of a lot of booze, and he was standing in the kitchen area with his, uh, well, you know how, just like this, you know, hand on the trigger. And he heard me come in, and he was like this, heard me come in, and he just turned like this. And there was that Thompson submachine gun right at my gut. I, I didn't say a word, I didn't even blink an eye, I just turned and walked out of the room, down the steps. Right. And I was waiting for that son of a bitch to shoot me. Sure. And then I heard somebody clubbing with a 